Good morning, Overflow. You guys look good this morning. Yeah, you guys look good. I am so excited to be up here. I feel set up for success by Pastor Alex because of the series we've been in and because of that incredible video. But he has been giving such insightful, invaluable information and context on women in the gospel, Old and New Testament, that has set me up today to be able to share with you guys my hope and the love that I found in Jesus Christ in my life with you this morning. So if you were expecting a taller, more dynamic, trendy male to be preaching this morning, He'll be back next week, but I am excited to be here. My name is Ellie Kelling, and I'm originally from mid-Missouri, and I came here to go to Bethel University for college, and when I graduated, Pastor Alex thought it was going to be a good idea to give me the responsibility to shepherd and lead and pastor the college young adult ministry here at Overflow. So that is what I do here, and it has been the most valuable challenging, beautiful, humbling experience that I have ever had in my life. And all of the students and people within Overflow Young Adults, they're my friends. So I'm getting to grow alongside my friends as I lead them, they lead me, and it's just awesome. And I love getting to do this. So we're going to talk about two things today. We're going to talk about number one, Jesus. We're going to look at him today. And then we're going to talk about the scriptures and look at the Bible today. So without wasting any time, let's pull out your Bibles, digital or paper, and turn to Psalm 86. This is not a free pass to check your Facebook marketplace, text your friend back, look around on your phone, hit the Bible app, and if you don't have one, we will also have the verses on the screen this morning, so you guys can follow along that way. But on a personal note, I believe that Jesus has something for each one of us today, including me. And he is so sovereign that he, Ellie can only speak one thing at one time. But the Lord can speak to our hearts and our minds to each single one of us all at the same time here, but also across the globe. So millions of people can be guided and loved on by the Lord at one, in one moment. So if you are expecting that with me today, I encourage you guys to lean in. Pull out your notes, whatever you need to do to focus, to lean in, because he has something for you. And he wants to love you this morning. Let's read Psalm 86, 11 through 13. Teach me your way, Lord, that I might rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I might fear your name. I will praise you, Lord my God, with all of my heart. I will glorify your name forever, for great is your love toward me. You have delivered me from the depths and from the realm of the dead. So if you're taking notes this morning, the official title today is The Love That We Long For. The Love That We Long For. Here in Psalm 86, David is crying out to God. Like the song we just sang of surrounded with, there's enemies on every side. David had literal enemies all around him. Saul was coming to kill him. There were people chasing after him. And he cried out to God and said, God, protect me. Keep me safe. I have been faithful to you and I need you to pull through and I need you to guard my life. So David is crying out and he's, he asks God for an undivided heart. Well, what, what is that? An undivided heart is a heart that serves one master, one God. It is not a heart that halfway serves God and halfway serves man and pleases the world. It is an undivided devotion and allegiance to one. It means we have a heart devoted and focused to the things unseen. We're not looking at the things of earth, but we're setting our mind on things above. To serve God with an undivided heart requires humility because it requires a teachable mind. If we have pride, we cannot have a teachable mind to be molded and shaped by God. So we need to have humility if we wanna be like David to have an undivided heart to God. So I believe that this is the same prayer that we can be praying as a church today. Lord, give us an undivided heart 
for you. As I began writing this message, I thought, man, where do I begin of things that I could share with you, of what I want you to know as the church, what I think that God has shown me in the last several months to deliver, and I started making a bullet point list of my favorite things about God. I I wrote, what are my favorite things about God the Father? What are my favorite things about God the Son, Jesus? And then what do I love about the Holy Spirit? And as I started making bullet points, I filled up a page because of how much he has done for me. And I'm gonna read you a couple of those this morning. First, he provides for my big and small needs. This is so practical, you guys. This week, I was voting on my lunch break, and I ran in somewhere quick to grab some lunch. It was full, 30 people in line. So I was like, eh, it's okay, I'll just skip. And my mom called me over lunch. She's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm voting. And um, she said, well, have you gotten lunch? And I said, no, because, you know, whatever. And she said, that's okay. I just bought you a sandwich through Subway. Like you can go pick it up. No worries. And I thought, how cool is God? He gave me a sandwich. Like he provides for us. Are you asking him what you need? Like, are you telling him what you're needing? We tell our friends and we tell our spouse, but we don't tell God, God, I need a sandwich. Can you help me out? God, I need to pay this bill. Can you help me this month? Like, can you help me come through with this? And he will. So he provides really big things, but he provides the smallest, somewhat silly things too that still matter to him. He listens to me. He never gets tired of hearing me. He understands my humanity because I have limitations. You have limitations. We have weaknesses. And Jesus was a human, so he actually understands. He empathizes with us because he was a human too. He had physical limitations. He had to sleep. He had to rest. He had to eat. He was a human. He also comforts and counsels me. He shows me grace when I fail to live out who I really am in him, when I sin, when I turn away. He offers me forgiveness He has erased my sins as far as the east is from the west. He has set me free from sin that held me captive for years, and he's replaced it with his lasting joy, with his lasting peace, and with something that actually satisfies the longings of my heart. He is my closest friend, and he knows me the most, but he loves me the best, and that's who God is. So I resonate with Psalm 86 and saying, Lord, give me an undivided heart. I don't wanna serve two masters. Help me have an undivided heart for you. And I wanna love you back. We were made for God. It's clear that we were made for him. If you guys have ever been far from him, you can feel it. You know, oh man, like I've been made to be in God's presence. I've been made to be with him. We were made for eternity. We were made to live in communion with God. And it's from the very beginning of the gospels. We see it start in Genesis 1. Genesis 1, 27, for God created man in his own image. In his own image, he created them, male and female. He created them and he was with them in the garden. He was flesh to flesh, spirit to spirit. He was right there with them. He was walking with them, talking with them. And they lived in communion with God and there was no, there was nothing bad there. But then Adam and Eve thought we would rather be like God than to just be with God. And how much do we do that today? We would much rather be like God than to just be with God. So they ate the fruit and it caused a massive divide. They were no longer in communion. There is an alienation now. They're alienated from God. They are far off. There's this massive chasm in between and they feel shame. They're embarrassed. And so in shame, they go and they cover themselves with leaves. They're ashamed and they're made aware of their sin. And so this thrust all of eternity or all of humanity into the cycle of sin that we're born into. And we know from Romans, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So if we're born into sin, We had to have a blood living sacrifice to atone for what all of humanity does wrong. Our separation from God has to be fixed through a blood offering. And so God sent his son and he lived perfect sinless life so that he could be that blood sacrifice to atone for us. He died. People killed him on a cross and then he rose three days later, and he defeated all sin, hell, death, and the grave, and he's now seated at the right hand of God, 
And he did that to bridge the gap of us being alienated from God. So now we can have eternal life here on earth right now today. And we can have eternal life when we die. It's both. We don't have to wait. So many of us think we have to wait till we're, we're with him to experience eternal life. No, his kingdom is here. Are you in his kingdom now? It's happening. It is the kingdom of light. And it's here. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection restored us through, to God through salvation. My question, the burning question of today, is do we long and love the Lord? Do we long and love the Lord? I've been thinking about this question for a while, and I'm thinking about what does it mean to return to our first love? When people say that, what does that mean? What is it? What is love? What does it mean to know love? How can I know that I know love? How do I love people better? How do I abide in this love? These are questions that are in my mind. And so if we look at the first question of what is love, there's a couple verses that I think of. First John 4:16 says this. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever abides in love abides in him, and God abides in them. Jude 1, 20 through 21 says, But you, beloved, building yourself up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in love with God. Keep yourselves in love with God, waiting for his mercy in our Lord Jesus Christ that leads us to eternal life. So what we see here is that God is love. The love term here is agape. And agape is not a worldly love. It is an eternal, godly, sister, brotherly kind of love. Not like eros, which is the romantic love, and not like philia, which is the friendship love. It is a choice, and it's a love that has no expectations. So if you've ever loved someone and expected nothing in return, you have experienced agape love. It's a love that is selfless. This is the kind of love that changes our mind, it changes our heart, it should change our speech, it should change our life, it should change everything about us because this this love is heavenly and it doesn't waver. John 15, 13 says, greater love has no one than this that someone would lay down his life for his friends. So the greatest example of what is love is that Jesus laid down his life for you, for me. There is no greater love. And we see that he still chose us and demonstrated his love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So while we were still alienated, while we were still actively in sin, God chose us then, and he chooses us now. And this is the everlasting love that does not, we cannot comprehend it. It is from God. Like the prodigal son and the dad, God is like the father who hikes up his garment. He sprints full send to come to you just because you came back. He does not mind what you have done and what you have run from. He cares that you come back. Is there anybody that needs to come back to him today and turn your face back to the one who loves you most, your first love? If you loved someone ever, a friend, a spouse, a sibling, a significant other, you know what it feels like to long for them, right? Like if they go away and they're gone on a trip for a week or a year or a month, your heart aches for them. You just want to see them. You're like, can we FaceTime? I just want to see your face because I love you and I long for you. But how come when we're at the grocery store and we check out our items, we get in the car, we are not like at least I'm not, we're not aching to go see our cashier again. We're not like longing to see them again. It was a good experience, but we don't have that ache in our bones to see them. Why? Because you, you love those that you know. If you know someone, you have a shared experience with them. You have memories, you have trust that's been built, you have felt love, you have felt comfort, 
You have a relationship. You have an understanding of who they are, so you know them. And because you know them, you love and you long for them. You ache to see them again. So we cannot love and long for the Lord if we don't know him. Of course we don't long for him. We don't know him. We see the same kind of longing in Romans, in the Roman people found in 1 Corinthians. The Romans at this time, they were told, you must bow down to Caesar. He is Lord, he is God. And the early church knew, no, he is not God. I will not bow down because there's only one God and that's Jesus Christ. So because of this, they were, talk about battles, they were getting persecuted and killed because they would not bow down to Caesar. So there's persecution happening everywhere, and at this time, the Romans in the church, they knew, you know, God is, Jesus has not come for peace. Jesus says in Matthew and in Luke, I have not come to bring peace, but I have come with a sword. I have come to divide. I have come, and at the the root of the gospel, it is offensive. It does divide us. It divides what is genuine and what is ingenuine. Jesus did not come for peace. He came to divide. He came with a sword. And so the Romans at this time, they were greeting one another with the word shalom, which means peace. And they'd see each other and they'd say, peace, peace be with you. But as all this persecution was taking place, a new word came into their vocabulary. And it was a word that was encouraging. It brought hope to each other because they knew this is bad. Like people are hurting, people are being killed, destroyed. So instead of greeting one another with shalom, they started greeting one another with the Aramaic word maranatha. They'd say maranatha, and it means come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord. If you saw Jacob's hat during worship, it said maranatha on it. But this is the new thing that they adopted in saying, I see your pain. I see what you're going through. This is bad. But you know what? Take heart. Maranatha. He's coming. He's going to restore everything. Keep your eyes on the things unseen. Keep your undivided heart towards him. Maranatha. It makes me wonder, do we pray and do we encourage one another in the church in the same way? Are we praying like David saying, Lord, give us an undivided heart? And are we looking at one another like the Romans saying, hey, I see you. This is awful. But Maranatha, take heart. Take heart. He sees you and he's coming. He's coming back. He will not leave it like it is. I believe the Lord is looking today for a heart and a church that is faithful to him. Not just Overflow Church that's faithful to him. I'm talking Big C Church worldwide. He is scanning the earth looking for where are my faithful children that love and long for me, who don't just meet on corporate in corporate gatherings, but are in their home, at their workplace, in their car, praying to me in the middle of a Tuesday about all of these things and wanting to see my face, begging to see my face in the middle of a work week. Who are the faithful ones who are longing to see me? Because he is coming, and we get to long for him as we wait. When he scans our city, how is he finding you? Are we living in purity? Are we living with integrity, truly? If he saw you, how would he find you? The Lord, Jesus, he went to the the Garden of Gethsemane, right before he was crucified. This is a place he went to a lot to pray, and it was at the base of the Mount of Olives, and he went here, and he invited his three closest friends because he was burdened. The weight of what was coming through the cross was heavy. Remember, he was human. He sweat blood and tears because he knew what was ahead of him. So he asked his buddies, like, hey, come with me to the garden. Come pray with me. Be with me. And what did his best friends do? They fell asleep. What, what a bro. You know, just fell asleep as Jesus is sweating blood, knowing what's ahead of him. They're just, they're out. But what's important that I noticed here is that God is faithful when humans aren't. Humans, we fall asleep. We miss the mark. But God sent an angel that night to comfort Jesus. And God was faithful even when humans weren't. 
But how often are we just like Peter, James, and John? We are falling asleep at the reality that's right in front of us. Our eyes are open, but our hearts are not. Our hearts are asleep. Our minds are asleep. We're, we're working through life. We're doing all these things. We're chasing all these things. We have all these relationships. We have all these, but we're asleep to the reality that his kingdom is here and that he's coming. Are we asleep today to this reality? One of the greatest needs in our church is the need to be awake and alert. His kingdom is here and he's coming. Do we long and love for the Lord? You see, there was a time that I locked myself out of a house where I was dog sitting. Unfortunately, this was not the first time that this has happened. I promise. I'm trustworthy. I will watch your house, your dogs, whatever. But I might lock myself out, so leave me a spare. So this particular day, I was rushing to church, and I made a French press. So coffee, which I guess I wasn't that late if I had time to make a French press. <laughs> but I made my coffee, and I was like, you know, I'll just leave the grounds on the counter. I'm coming back to clean. So I left, I had my bag kind of undone, I had my laptop out, the blanket was off the couch, and it just wasn't, the house wasn't how I had found it, because I knew I was coming back. I was going to clean it, and I would, I always leave the houses I'm at better or the same as when I found them. So I thought, oh, it's no big deal, I'll just go to church. Well, I get to church, and I'm in the lobby, and it dawns on me, the unforeseen, horrible act, I locked the key in the kitchen, the only key. Now, I need to, like, add a footnote right here because all the animals, the chickens, everybody was outside in their cages. They had food, so no animals were harmed in this story. However, my pride was. So I was immediately embarrassed. I'm like, no, we're about to start church. And my friend Jenna, who's actually in the house today, go Jenna. She lives in Nashville, but she was in town that weekend. I'm like, Jenna, no, like, what do I do? This is so embarrassing. And she's like, it's okay. Like, you know what? We're gonna do this. We're gonna go and we're gonna, we're gonna, crawl through the roof and through the top window and we're gonna crawl, <laughs> we're gonna get inside because I knew the upper level was unlocked and we're gonna get inside, we're gonna get that key and I'm like, yes. I mean, Jenna's a fitness instructor. Like she is the real deal. If anybody can scale a house, it's gonna be her. And so that's what we did. I'm like, this is good. So we went home that night and in fact, I pulled my car up right in front of the house and I hope there's not tire tracks but we pull up to the house and Jenna climbs on top of my car. And this is like winter time. Like we're in coats. It had kind of rained a little bit that day. And so the roof, she starts getting up there. She's successful. And she's like, Ellie, the roof is slick. And I'm like, no, we cannot. I cannot risk your life today because I left my gra coffee grounds on the counter. Like I'm going to be fine. Just come on. So what a friend. So we, we leave, and it was fine. The family came back. They were gracious. It was fine. I went and collected my things, and we had a good laugh about it. But it dawned on me when I was at church that Sunday. I was thinking about it, and I was like, oh, this is what it's going to feel like for those that aren't ready for Christ's return. This is what it's going to feel like. The embarrassment, the not readiness, the shame the, oh man, I just wish I could get back in there and clean up that mess I made. And I started thinking that day, Ellie, if God came back today, how would he find you? Would you be proud of what he found? Not just in the external world, but like in my heart, in my mind, in my everything. Would he be proud? Would he say, Ellie, well done, good and faithful servant. You have given your life as an offering. You have been faithful. You have sacrificed your ways and your desires. Come be with me now. Welcome to the wedding feast. Or would I be embarrassed? And that's the question I want to present to us today is if he came back today, tomorrow, this week, how would he find you? Because I thought I could go back and clean and get it all ready before I knew they were coming home. I knew I had time. And we, we think that way. We're like, he's coming back, but it's probably not now. It's probably in, you know, 400 years or whatever it is. And it may be. But he doesn't tell us the time nor the hour. So how are we living? Who are we not forgiving? What are we not correcting in our hearts towards Jesus? What is our relationship with him truly like? When everything else is stripped away, 
and it's just left to you and him, what is there? What is that connection really like? I wanna share with you one of my favorite parables that matches this story and goes along with what we're talking about today. A couple weeks ago, Overflow Young Adults were going to Nashville. We were going to a worship night, and one of my friends turned on a song in the car, and it was about our oil and our lamps and it burning. And I said, do you know what this is from? And she's like, no, what's this from? So we start sifting through the Bible, and we find the parable. And she reads it a few times in the car on the way there. And we're thinking about this parable, and, and the girls in the car are like, why have you never heard this? And I'm like, I don't know. It isn't taught on much. It's just one of those. There's so many cool parables in there. And so we get to the worship night. We're a couple hours in, and I'm in the back of the room at this point. They're in the front of the room. And the guy gets up to speak, and out of the entire Bible that he could have preached on or shared on, he talked about Matthew 25, the same parable we read on the way there. And those girls whipped around, and their jaws dropped, and my jaw dropped, and I'm like, did you hear that? They're like, yeah. It's so cool because that's how God speaks. If you're seeing something repeating, and it's coming back, and it's, it's showing up all the time, he's probably speaking and communicating with you. He is faithful to communicate with us through whatever form we have faith for. So Matthew 25, we're gonna read it. It says this, then the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamp and went to the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, five of them were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no extra oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil for their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they became drowsy and they fell asleep. But at midnight, there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom. Come out and meet him. All the virgins rose and they trimmed their lamps. They got ready and the, un, the foolish ones looked at the wise and said, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. But the wise answered and said, since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were away to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and then the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. We want to see you. We want to be with you. And he came out, and he said, truly, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you don't know the day or the hour of his return. So what we see here is a common Jewish tradition for weddings. The groom would be away and the bride would be with her bridesmaids and their job was to keep their lamps and their oil burning because they were gonna light the way, just like a wedding with an aisle, they were gonna light the way so that when the groom came at night, it would illuminate and it'd be this celebration. There was excitement and joy and anticipation. It was this big cultural thing that they did. So that was their job. And lighting the path was a way to honor the groom and to show him their hospitality. But there's symbolism to be found here for us today. By having their lamps prepared and lit, the bridesmaids showed that they were ready to welcome the groom. The lamps represent our readiness and our alertness for the coming of Christ. This can be seen by our lives and the state of our hearts and minds. So our lives are like the lamp. It's our preparedness to meet him again. The foolish were those who lack the essential preparation for meeting Christ. While the wise brought not only oil to light the lamp, but extra oil to keep it burning, they knew the oil can't light the lamp, but the oil can keep it burning. So they brought some for the journey. The reality here is that Jesus is the groom and we, the church, are his bride. And he is coming back for us. He's told us this. He's coming back for the ones that love and long for him. Hebrews 9.28 says this. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who eagerly wait for him. He's coming back for those who eagerly wait for him. 
The oil is the present presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The Holy Spirit is what keeps us burning for him. We cannot strive nor try in our own strength to keep burning as we wait for the groom to come. That is impossible without Christ. But as we abide in him, the Holy Spirit stirs up in us the ability to eagerly wait and anticipate Christ's return. So we must have the Holy Spirit to help us in this journey, help us as we wait, help us long for him. Holy Spirit, help us long for you. He makes our heart eager and alert. He allows our heart and prompts our heart to fall more in love with God. He's actually the one that reveals God to us. If you've been saved, the Holy Spirit has opened your eyes to see who Christ is. He has led you to that. He lights the way and he makes us aware so you can see him. If you think about it, oil in a lamp produces the light and the light helps us see. Do we have oil in the lamp today? Can we see God for who he is? The parable gives us two powerful reminders. The first one, we must live with a state of readiness. As believers, we not only believe and look for God, but we should long and love God. How we obey him daily, how we read his word, how we live with him, how we communicate with him, this is how we are prepared. This is how we can anticipate and be ready for his return. The second thing is this. It shows us that we have a personal responsibility in our faith. When I stand before God at the end of time, it will not be me and the ministry team behind me and my family and all these mentors and friends that have led me the way. It will be me and God. It will not be my pastor's faith, my friend's faith, my family's faith, this faith, my Instagram reel's faith. It will be your faith that stands before God. So we have a personal responsibility, just like agape love. We have to choose him. It is a personal responsibility to have a relationship with God. Too many of us who've been in the faith for a long time, all love is not gone with God, but our first love has left. Our zeal that we had when we first encountered him, that excitement, that passion, that longing, that ache to just be with him, that's left for many of us. How long will we wait? How long will we wait to go back to our first love? It was hard for the disciples to stay awake for an hour. It was hard for the bridesmaids to stay awake. And it is hard for us to stay awake. We fall asleep spiritually. We need him to open our eyes. We need him to help us return to the zeal and the first love that we've had. We become so asleep that complacency is normal. That thinking on things of this earth is expected. We all do that. Anxiousness has run rampant. Death has run rampant. Addiction has run rampant because we've allowed ourselves to fall asleep to the reality. Sin, when we're asleep, becomes unbridled. We can't get out of it. We're stuck. The purity we once had is lost. But it doesn't have to stay this way. He can be the one that puts oil in our lamps to see him and eagerly wait for him, if you're willing. If you're willing to say, Lord, give me an undivided heart. Help me love you and long for you more. Let's read Revelation 19, six through 10. Revelation 19, six through 10. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen 
is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said, write this, because blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet and I worshiped him. And he said, do not worship me, worship God. Do not worship me, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Which means that what Jesus has done already, he can do again for you and for me. The testimony of who Jesus is, is the spirit of prophecy. His bride has made herself ready. The bride has made herself ready. This means that the bride has done what is necessary to take place alongside her groom. Just like the arrangements that lead up to a wedding day, the bride is intentional about preparing herself both physically and mentally and in her heart, in her purity. She's preparing herself for her groom and she's longing and excited for that day. Why? Because she knows her groom. If we're getting married to someone we don't know, that's not exciting. I would not be excited. I'd be like, let me not show up because we wanna know the one we're longing for. We wanna know the one that is coming for us. So a bride makes herself ready. She does the things to be ready. There is excitement, anticipation, and joy for the union of two. And there is excitement, anticipation, and joy for the longing of us with Christ. He finds us beautiful. Like a groom coming for his bride, he finds us beautiful. Males and females in the room, he finds you beautiful. And not because you're perfectly sinless, because we're not, but because we're hidden inside of Christ. If we're his, we're like hidden in this bubble, and the bubble is Jesus. And so when Christ looks at us, when God looks at us, he does not see all of our sin. He doesn't see all of our brokenness. He actually sees us spotless and pure if we're his. And it's because he's cast our sins as far as the east is from the west. Some of you today need to stop thinking about and living in the reality of what you did in your sin. He has forgiven you. It is wiped clean. And I need you to know today that you're free. You've already been free. Are you going to turn back to him? Are you going to look back to the first love and believe that you're really free? Because of Christ, you are spotless and beautiful, and he's coming for you. He's not gonna leave you. My goal in sharing with you guys today is to make us aware of this reality, that Jesus is alive, he's coming back for his bride, and he's coming back for you. He's invited you to the feast. Are you RSVPing? Are you going? Do you love and long for him? That wasn't in my notes, I'm so sorry. Are you loving and longing for him? Are you gonna go? Or are you gonna sit back? It's an invitation. And in love, he leads all of our expectations on the floor. He's like, I don't want any of y'all to be blindsided and shocked when you get to heaven one day. He's like, I'm gonna lay it all out. You ready? This is what he requires. Come, be ready. That's it. He invites us. And I don't want anyone to get to the day of judgment and think, I wish someone would have told me. I wish someone would have told me he's coming back and that I could have gotten ready for this, that I could have actually been excited for this, that I would quickly join his side in this union and not be embarrassed or shameful to be like, you know, I should have done that sooner. He wants us to experience that right now. Intimacy with him is not just possible, but it's actually the result of knowing him. When you know Jesus, there's intimacy. You don't have to try and strive. It's in faith and he's close if you know him. When the Lord looks over our city and our nation, I want him to find us faithful. Just like when God looked over Sodom and Gomorrah, He looked for the faithful ones. He found very few, very little. I want him to look over us and our nation and find so many faithful children 
who are serving him, who have given him our allegiance, who has given him an undivided heart for him. We will not be perfect in this pursuit. We know it's by grace that we've been saved. It's through faith. It's not so anyone can boast. I need you to know Jesus came and he evened the playing field. He said, none of us are better. None of us are higher. No age, race, demographic. He evened the playing field. He said, it's by grace that you've been saved through faith. His grace leads us to his love. Has his grace led you to his love? It is not religion. It is his love. And we can long for him. Today, if we're believers, we should wake up every day and realize, oh, is today the day? Is today the day of the return of my groom, of the return of Jesus? We should hit our, hit our feet on the floor every morning and be like, Lord, we are so needy for you. We need you today. It's good to be needy for God. Be needy for the Lord, because that requires humility. He could come back anytime. And I want us to be ready. Maranatha reminds us to keep our eyes on eternal things of the spirit and not on fleshly things, not on this earth. If we look around, we are discouraged. I'm discouraged when we look around. But if you look up, you are infused with a hope that doesn't make sense. It's a peace that surpasses all understanding because your eyes have been set on Christ. Where are your eyes? today. The Lord is coming. If you're discouraged today, I want to tell you, Maranatha, he's coming. If you're in pain today and in grief today, he sees and he says, hey, Maranatha, I'm coming. If you feel very lost today and in sin, he looks at you and he says, Maranatha, I'm coming. And if you love him and you're longing for him, you just, wanna, you just wanna see him, you just wanna be with him, you wanna hug him. If that's you, he says, Maranatha, I'm coming. And I'm coming soon. You guys can stand with me this morning. If you're on the prayer team, actually, we're not gonna do that right now. We're gonna hold off on that. I wanna offer you guys an opportunity today that if this is something you're like, you know, I love the Lord, but ah, the zeal of my first love is not really what I'd say this last week reflected, and you just need to look back at him and just turn back today, go back to your first love today. Give him your undivided heart. This coming week, seek his face. He'll be ready, he'll be waiting. And you can do that right from where you're standing. Just talk to him today. It's simple. And if you're far off and you're like, you know, I don't actually, I don't know if I know him. We're like cashier level. But we're not like best friend level. And if, you're, if you don't know him, you've never surrendered your life to him, you've never given over your ways fully in your heart and in your mind, I wanna give you an opportunity today to do that. We're gonna pray a prayer of salvation and there will be salvation today because you can know him and he's coming for you. So we're gonna close.